And we are live at Beta Vini. We are on. So welcome everybody. Last week we were talking about the dynamic of uh, Sarah and Hagar and how Abraham and Sarah sent them to their new estate. They didn't just kick them out into the wilderness to die. And we don't have a lot left on this teaching, so it's going to be a short one. So what I will do is I will kick things off with last week's parsha that we did not get to hear on Shabbat because it was edited by Rabbi Stanley but at a later point. And a, a parsha is a, a passage of scripture dealing with a single topic, like a focused study, and a lot of Bibles will uh, will title that at the beginning of certain subjects. And we kind of just collectively study that each week. Now, our ordained scribe writes these parshas, and it's pretty advanced stuff. So there's a lot of Hebrew vocabulary, and I'll, I'll just run over some of that with you. So this parsha is 13.6 Shemot, and that means names. Like from Shem, Shem means name. Whenever we say Hashem, that means the name. The name, yeah. Because we know that God has a name that nobody else knows except Him, and we also have many titles for Him. For example, Yeshua the Messiah. Also, Eloheinu means our God. Adonai means Lord. Avenu is our Father, and this synagogue is called Beit Avenu, that means house of our Father. And Yudhe Vavhe, which is pronounced Yehovah, and to explain that a little bit, uh, that's, a, that's not actually his name, it's another title. It's an acronym that's broken down from the dead root Eya Ashe Eya, and uh, to spell it out, it's Asher Ahaya Vehove Veavo which means he who was, who is, and is to come. That's what he is, it's not his name. All right, so this Dadrash, which is short for a, a Midrash, that's a, a critical explanation of scripture, uh, will contain a lot of names in Hebrew, so I'll try to translate them as I go. Uh, when you hear Moishi, that's Moses. Yeshayahu is Isaiah. Avraham is Abraham, Yitzchak is Isaac, Yaakov is Jacob, Hava is Eve, uh, Kohenim is the priestly family as designated by Hashem, and uh, this is an important word, uh, Teshuvah, it means repentance, or return is the literal translation of that, as in returning to something that you've strayed from or looked away from. And a couple other names we'll hear in here are uh, Bathsheba, that's Bathsheba in English, or Yohanan is John. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, we'll be talking about John the Beloved. And Matityahu is Matthew. Oh, another title we call God is uh, Sebaot, which means Lord of Hosts. Okay, we begin our parsha with the second book of the Torah, The Calling of Moishi. When he noticed the bush was burning, but was not consumed, he approaches to investigate. Hashem then speaks to him. He said, don't come any closer. Take your sandals off your feet, because the place where you're standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father. He continued, the God of Abraham, Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, Isaac, and the God of Yaakov, Jacob. Rabbi says, Yehovah, pay attention to these sacred namers out there. <laughs> Why does it that? Oh, because uh, a lot of them will say Yahweh instead of Yehovah because right. they believe that the Vav is pronounced Wa, like, like a W. But there's no W in the Hebrew language. That comes from an Arabic slur. And in Proto-Arabic, there was a V sound at some point. It was mm -hmm. drawn as a viper. Oh, good Robert time. You made it. 
Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Okay, so Hashem's talking to Moishi. Tells him, take off your sandals, uh, because the place where you're standing is holy ground. I am the Adonai of your father, he continued. The Adonai of Abraham, the Adonai of Yitzchak, the Adonai of Yaakov. So Moishi covered his face because he was afraid to look at Hashem. Notice that Hashem kept Moishi at a distance. When Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin defending himself from false accusations, he recounts the early history of Israel. When he gets to Moishi in the burning bush, he says in Acts 7.32, he said, But Moishi trembled with fear and didn't dare to look. We know the separation began in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Hava, Eve, uh, Hava is sometimes translated as to live and breathe or to give life, uh, when Adam and Eve transgressed and were expelled from the garden. Fortunately, the separation was not, in, was not eternal as of yet, for Hashem had already set his plan for redemption in motion. Unfortunately, there would always be a distance between Hashem and the human race, even with the most righteous of men, until this redemption has its complete fulfillment. Our present physical state will not allow us to behold Hashem in his fullness without severe consequences. A few scriptural examples illustrates that this distance must be maintained. When Hashem descended on Mount Sinai, He gave these instructions to Moishi. In Shemot 19, 21-25, Shemot means the names uh, in the English Bibles, it, that's Exodus. Adonai said to Moishi, Go down and warn the people not to force their way through to Adonai to see Him. If they do, many of them will perish. Hey, Cody, hey, Julie. Hey. We're doing uh, the Parsha from last week. So even the Kohanim, that's the priestly families, who are allowed to approach Adonai must keep themselves holy. Otherwise, Adonai may break out against them. When she said to Adonai, the people can't go up to Mount Sinai because you ordered us to set limits uh, around the mountain and separate it. But Adonai answered him, go get down, then come back up. You and Aharon with you. That's his brother Aaron. Then come back up, you and Aharon, uh, together, it says, uh, but don't let the Kohanim and the people force their way through to come up to Adonai, or he will break out against them. So Moishi went down to the people and he told them. Evidently, Hashem felt they needed a second warning so that the people's desire to cross the boundary would not get the best of them. Can you project a little more? Sure. Please. Slow down a little bit. You got it. Thank you. In Exodus 20, uh, verse 15, it says, All the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled. Standing at a distance, they said to Moishi, uh, You speak with us and we will listen, but don't let Hashem speak with us or we will die. And they claimed to think that Hashem being that close to them made them aware of their transgression and guilt. The prophet Yeshayahu Isaiah seemed to have a, had a similar experience after seeing Hashem's glory fill the temple. In Isaiah 6, 5, it says, Woe to me, I too am doomed, because I am a man with unclean lips, living among a people with unclean lips. Have seen with my own eyes the king Adonai Tzevaoth, the Lord of hosts. After Israel had transgressed by worshipping the golden calf, right at the base of that very mountain, Moshe was receiving the Torah there. How did this affect their relationship with Hashem? In Exodus 33, 7, it says, Moshe would take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far away from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting, the Mishkan in Hebrew. Everyone who wanted to consult Adonai would go out to the tent of meeting outside the camp. It seems that walking the extra distance served as a reminder why it had to be that way. I think when a believer commits a major transgression, though there is immediate forgiveness after confession, a spiritual distance is experienced for a while before the relationship is restored to its re uh, former level. Mm -hmm. While one's relationship with Hashem can be restored through Teshuvah, that's repentance, unfortunately it may never be fully restored on a human level with certain people. This is what probably happened with King David after he transgressed with Bathsheba. Distance from Hashem through Yeshua is also implied in the Brit Hadashah in connection with evil works. In Yochanan, John uh, 3, 19 through 21, it says, Now this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their actions were wicked. 
For everyone who does evil things hates the light and avoids it, so that his actions won't be exposed. But everyone who does what is true comes to the light, so that all may see that his actions are accomplished through Hashem. We will never eliminate our distance from Hashem on our own in this life, but our goal should be to minimize it as much as possible, and this takes effort. In Matigyahu, Matthew, uh, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Go in through the narrow gate, for the gate that leads to destruction is wide and the road broad, and many travel it. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Those who take the wide gate and the broad road can be likened to the weeds in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Yeshua describes them as people who are far from Torah. Sounds like a great distance from Hashem, much to their disadvantage. For those of us who want to take the narrow gate and the hard road, the instructions are simple. But that, the doing can be difficult still. Obey Yeshua, obey Torah. And know that Yeshua will take us uh, the rest of the way when he returns. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, for Adonai himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry, with a call from one of the ruling angels, and with Hashem's shofar. Those who died united with the Messiah will be the first to rise. Then we who are left alive still will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet Adonai in the air, and thus we will always be with Adonai. So these scriptures are taken from the complete Jewish Bible by Dr. David Stern. And... This was this parshah was written by one of our ordained scribes, Mr. M R D. We'll call him. Okay, so back to the teaching on Abraham and Sarah. Uh, Ruth is here. Hello, my sweet wife. Is Justin on? Easy. Cool. All right, back to the Abraham and Sarah teaching. So to recap, uh, we find out that the first words from Abraham in the Bible are, are talking about his instructions to Sarah to tell the Pharaoh that she's his sister. And then later on we see uh, Hagar and Sarah don't really get along so well because Hagar was arrogant and her son Ishmael was a brat and they got kicked out, basically. But they were sent with provisions and given their own land and, and a well at that, which is more than I've ever had, you know, comparatively. If I had a well in the desert, I would not really be complaining so much. I'll figure out how to work the slides. Okay, I don't think they can see the slides online, but it says in chapter 17, the covenant Abraham uh, had with Hashem sees its final stage. It's years later, but always in due time. In verse 2, Hashem says to Abraham, I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will increase your numbers greatly. Abraham fell on his face, and Hashem continued speaking with him. As for me, this is my covenant with you, Hashem says. You will be the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Avram, which means exalted father, but your name will be Avraham, the father of many, because I have made you the father of many nations. I will cause you to be very fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will descend from you. I am establishing my covenant between me and you, along with your descendants after you, generation after generation, as an everlasting covenant to be God for you and for all of your descendants after you. So this is uh, long before Yeshua. And he's saying this is forever. He's not going to revoke any of these covenants just because he comes as the word in the flesh. And last time we talked about a covenant involves literal cutting. So he goes on to tell him in verse 8, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are now foreigners, all the land of Canaan as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. Hashem said to Abraham, As for you, you are to keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you, generation after generation. He's rather repetitive about that, so I think he means it seriously for effort. And here is my covenant, which you are to keep, between me and you, 
along with your descendants after you. Every male among you is to be circumcised. So why did Hashem wait so long before telling Avram what his part of the covenant would be? That he would have to get circumcised, specifically. Well, the obvious would be that if you're going to ask someone to do something like that to themselves, you need to let them get to know you a little first. You gotta spend some time with them, years in fact. You have to foster a relationship with that person. And then just before you make that request, you offer them all of the land that they can see. It wouldn't have worked if he had asked Avram to do that years before. You remember we talked about Avram having some doubts back then early on. If the topic of circumcision would have even come up, Avram probably would have said, I knew this wasn't going to work out. I should have gone with my gut feeling and bailed on this weeks ago. And the whole story would have fallen apart, of course. So Avram had to get to know Hashem more and learn to trust Him more. But Avram does it, and thus the first Jew comes into existence. The the term Jew comes from the name Judah, but it's used retroactively for those who keep the commandments. As Rabbi Stanley taught us, the simplest definition of being Jewish by faith is to learn and keep the commandments to the best of our ability. And uh, this also is where his name was changed to Avraham, and Sarai's name was changed to Sarah, which means princess. At 99 years old, Avraham circumcises himself, as well as all the males in his household, which included all of his employees. How that conversation went down with the gardener, I have no idea. I would have been like, uh, sir, you didn't like the way I cut the roses? Can I at least sharpen my clippers first? <laughs> As we then enter chapter 18, Sarah is told she'll have a son, and then we find an unusual dialogue between Abraham and Hashem. There seems to be a kind of bartering between the two concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is thinking things over concerning the character of Hashem. He's made aware that Hashem is going to destroy these cities, so he ponders if Hashem will destroy them if there's righteous people amongst them. So he asks, will you destroy these cities if there are 50 righteous? Hashem says no. Then Avram goes through a few more numbers. What if there's 40, 30, 20, and he gets down to 10? But because there are not even 10 righteous people there, Avram then understands the justice in Hashem's plan and asks that Lot and his family at least be warned. And he, he does so. Hashem warns Lot, even though Lot's not a good man by most standards. When his house is surrounded by the townspeople, and they're calling for Lot to send out the male visitors that he had, Lot offers up his virgin daughters to be raped by them instead. He could have offered himself. But no, he offers up his own daughters. The townspeople are smitten with blindness, and they make their escape, but told not to look back. Lot's wife still has family that she has left behind. It says that Lot went into his son-in-law's house, and they thought he was joking. His daughters were virgins and not married, so there was still family left in Sodom. Lot's wife looks back to see if they're coming, and she becomes a pillar of salt. That doesn't mean that she turned into a statue of salt like they show us in Sunday school when we were little. Like that. It's just like a human-shaped pillar of salt. And that one's very meticulously designed. It's like a picturesque statue. No, nope, she didn't turn into a statue. The Dead Sea area is a very volcanic spot, and it erupted with hot gases that spewed uh, all the salt everywhere that was already in that area. And some of that landed on Lot's wife, and all that was left of where she was standing was a pillar of salt. There are many such pillars uh, still standing there today, and they look like this. That one kind of looks like a mushroom. <laughs> and this is basically just a giant clumping mass of salt. They're even sticking out of the water. There's literally hundreds of these down there, and any one of them could have been Lot's wife. Of course, on the tours, they'll uh, show you exactly which one they believe is Lot's wife. Chisel it out. I guess if you squint really hard, <coughs> kind of looks like an ugly lady. So Lot and his daughters flee to a cave after Zoar. In this cave, the daughters decide to get their father really drunk and commit incest. 
We're told in Sunday school that they did this because they thought they were the last people alive on Earth. There's a bit of a problem with that, though. They just left Zoar, which was a town full of people. And before that, they had already been promised that Zoar would be spared. They didn't sleep with them because they thought they were the last people on Earth. They did it because they were raised in Sodom. And frankly, I don't know what kind of level of drunkenness one has to reach to not be aware that he's having relations with his own daughter. And also take into consideration that alcohol wasn't that strong back then. We've gotten better at raising the alcohol content in the last 4,000 years. Not only did he sleep with them one night, uh, they took turns over a couple of nights. Is it possible to get that drunk? I've never been that twisted. Also, we don't know how his daughters felt about being offered up to the townspeople so liberally, and we don't know how old they were either. Once again, in adult Sunday school, they're pictured as women like this. I wouldn't know which one was his wife if, if it wasn't for the statue in the background. Uh, here's another picture and we have the same problem. I would assume they were much younger because after all they were virgins in Sodom. Any way you cut it, there are no winners in this story. The children of these incestuous unions became the patriarchs of the Ammonites and the Moabites, two of Israel's worst enemies later down the line. That's no compliment to the Israelites having to fight the retarded kids next door. <laughs> yeah, we won, but you know they're inbred, right? Big victory. So that's, a, that's the end of the teaching on Abraham and Sarah. Next time we'll do a, another class from the Tanakh survey probably, and then get into Messianic politics. So I hope you enjoyed the teaching. Does anybody have any questions? said, well, I thought uh, Abraham was already circumcised when he was a baby. No, he was the first one to start that trend. No. Yeah. That is an everlasting covenant between us and Yeshua. It's easier for uh, women to convert than men because all they need is a mikvah. But for guys, we've, we've got to take an extra step, and that's a pretty big step. You would have to knock me out. I mean, to where, like, I was gone. Yeah, you'd have to be beaten half to death, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and someone pulled you down, because you're going to wake up as soon as the procedure begins. Yeah, no oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had friends uh, get adult circumcisions, and it's very painful and very expensive. Oh, I bet. It's much easier to make that <clears throat> decision uh, when they're a baby, because they're not even going to remember the pain, and it's uh, it's considered much more uh, hygienic yeah because mm -hmm. when you change a baby boy you have to kind of peel back the foreskin to clean them otherwise they can get yeast infections yeah. Yeah. I've been through a lot of arguments with people about how it's a inhumane practice and yet these same people will pierce their baby girl's ears yeah that's not necessary nor biblical but there are piercings in some ancient Hebrew tribes. The only ones I've heard of was the uh, nose ring. Yeah. And women did that. Or when they would, uh, a slave wanted to stay with their master, they would do the their ear. Ruthie asked, so the way the descendants of Lot became the enemies of Abraham's children? Yeah. Of what? Of Abraham's children. Of mm -hmm. Israel. They, they were not very grateful for being spared after all. But, you know, it's, it's a kind of a mystery. The Moabites were so terrible. However, Ruth, our, our patron proselyte, came from the Moabites. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen some documentaries before on the uh, geographic anomaly that is that area where Sodom and Gomorrah would have been. There are pockets of uh, sulfur and gas, and that's just a recipe for disaster. But Hashem always takes something that's already there and then triggers it at just the right time. Like parting the sea. There is a high spot there, and at low tide, it, it could be dropped even lower 
you know, that's not a normal occurrence. Probably a once in a, a lifetime or once in a century or millennium thing. Rabbi said, yeah, and, and we could marry uh, Moabite women, but their men were not allowed to marry our women. Hey, Polaris. She said, sounds painful, but I think she was talking about the hot molten salt landing on them, not the circumcision. I'm not sure what point she came into. Questions online? Robert says, Thank you for the teaching. Devaka Shah, you're most welcome. Ruthie said, It doesn't seem fair that uh, we were allowed to take the Moabite women, but we wouldn't give our women to the men. I would say that it is fair because the Moabite men were no good. Hmm. All right. Tada Raba. I'll see you all next week. Signing off. Lucky Proud.